the more and more I try to, I would say, maybe get away from solar, and I call it solar gravity. I've always warned people that I've interviewed to come work in my teams is like, be cautious. If you take this job, there is a gravity that will surround you and you will find it very hard to get away from. I just kept getting pulled back into it. You've been warned. <laughs> yeah, and you've been warned. There is a gravity. Today's entrepreneur, Josh Froughton, has been in the industry for nearly two decades, starting as a solar tech, turning wrenches, connecting wires all the way back to 2005 in his home state of Arizona, where, as fate would have it, one of the industry stalwarts set up their own headquarters, First Solar, of course, and Josh was able to ride the juggernaut that was First Solar through more than 12 gigawatts, G-dub, <laughs> of business and go around the world building, breaking, and fixing stuff. And then he was able to jump over to Novasource. Many of you would recognize that company before building out a company called R7 Supply, which was just integrated into Renewable. Josh's story is one of those Cinderella stories in the industry where someone starts out boots on the roof and ends up running their own business. It has happened time and time again in this industry, and I'm super grateful for the opportunity to have a chat with Josh today. Now, I do want to have a, a small warning that Josh and I get into a very wonky conversation. If you are unfamiliar with how the utility scale sector works, don't be afraid. We break it down. And even Josh gets to the point where he realizes he's saying an acronym and spells it out for you like, like I hope that folks will do. But this is a very insightful conversation about how the operating and asset management side of utility scale solar in particular works and what we can learn from sectors like wind and where we still have miles to go in figuring out how this should be managed. Josh has done a lot more thinking on it than your average industry participant, and that's why I have him on the show. He also goes deep into his own entrepreneurial experience and the struggle with, is it really entrepreneurial? But yes, in fact, it is, as you'll see today. Today is going to be probably a little unorthodox, to be honest, because there's a lot that's still unknown in the public domain about what happens when we turn these projects on. Frankly, most of us listening and operating in this industry are working as feverishly as possible to just build and build and build. As our Secretary of Energy says, deploy, deploy. Well, at some point, we have to maintain and ensure that these assets are delivering every kilowatt hour that they were promised and that the bankers are looking for and checking their reports every month waiting for. And I see Josh nodding his head because he's been responsible for ensuring those kilowatt hours for the last decade. Josh Froughton, welcome to the show, man. It's so good to have you on, on Suncast. Well, um, Nico, been, can't wait to, to get going. This has been, uh, been looking forward to this, man, really. You know, there's something to be said for following intuition and inspiration and the serendipity that can lead you into leadership roles in a really young industry like solar. And we jumped in around the same time um, within a year of one another. And our paths can go different ways, but it's been fascinating to watch how your path led you to really being one of maybe a dozen industry experts with the, with the level of knowledge that you hold. And, the, and I'll say, like, I, I admired when I reached out to you originally, I said the power that that gives you to be able to be the, not only the arbiter of truth in some scenarios, but to say, hmm, I can now direct my own destiny in my path, right? So you recently announced the integration of R7 Supply into Renewable, one of the uh, up-and-coming operations and asset management businesses to try and standardize the process around owning, operating, and, um, and managing these renewable assets, this infrastructure class that we've been trying to build for the last two decades. I want to talk about that, but I want to do it through the lens of kind of what you've learned uh, that that ga that got you to the position where you could build an R seven in eighteen months, just what with what feels like to the industry overnight success, right? And as we know, I was in the music industry, no success overnight success. It's ten years, uh, ten years of hard work in the background um, that you don't get credit for, and then all of a sudden um, you get to open for Taylor Swift, and the world knows <laughs> that you're the next big thing, right? So, Josh, 
how do you, when you are talking with folks that find you because they're looking for your expertise, how, how do you explain your specific subject matter expertise and, and what you, what problems you are trying to solve? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of O and M, um, and me in particular, like it's a lot of fighting against obsolescence, the struggle of like keeping technician wrench time up, and it's no different than in, in construction, right? You yeah. got to have the parts to do the work, um, and so you know. Between those two things, you know, I used to say O and M's always you're always adding stuff to the back of the bus, right? The bus just gets bigger, so the number of aging assets, the the variety that are out there, complicates O and M as you scale um, to a large extent, right? Because uh, the assets are in different life cycle stages. I would say a large part of my my experience in O and M has been trying to balance those two, uh, you know, those two divergent worlds. You know, the the assets that are having difficulty finding parts for, servicing, technicians are, you know, uh, twirling thumbs while we're waiting for warranty, uh, you know, repairs to come out. Um, and, you know, as the, as the industry scaled, I've seen that problem become more and more impactful uh, to the business of O&M. Right. Having the parts and and even just the support from, you know, some of the OEMs. Uh, to quickly remediate issues. Let's drill down quickly early in this interview on this topic. So, you know, we have a mutual friend, Austin Tabor, who we both greatly respect for uh, for many things that he did, not the least, which is uh, being able to build a business that he ultimately uh, sold as well to Renewable. One of the things that he did really early that was smart, he and his co-founder came out of SMA. So let's just use SMA and we, like, I don't mind picking on SMA. They're the longest standing inverter in the marketplace. They're, they're, you know, the king of the hill as it were. So when we talk about, and, and it's na natural to talk about the person that's been around the longest when we get into conversations around obsolescence, because product design cycles have a, 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 a life cycle, right? So one of the things that impressed me was how they were addressing concerns with plants that were trying to figure out how to replace uh, failed power units and failed different, you know, this or that part that was no longer being manufactured. And for all intents and purposes, I think like SMA, as an example, had like a warehouse full of them and was charging, you know, um, maybe 10 X what they w were worth or could be made in the market. And smartly, um, Austin and other entrepreneurs figured out a way to reverse engineer and get those products into the hands of the technicians in the field. When did this issue of obsolescence really first enter into your worldview, your purview? Could you take me to the point where you saw this thing and thought, hmm, this is going to be something someday? Yeah. I mean, really at, at First Solar, First Solar at the time I was there, vertically integrated, right? Um, I came and think I was going to be on the construction side. They needed someone to help build this O&M side, which mm -hmm. was like 800 megawatts at the time in like 2012. Mm. And, you know, Got to see, you know, obviously focused on O and M, but got to talk to a lot of the supply chain professionals, especially in the manufacturing side. You know, the M and 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 those focused on MRO or maintenance repair operations, and they were talking about life cycles of production line equipment. And I'm looking at this, I'm like, hey, this is a power supply. This is the same thing that's in the Inver. And they're talking about these these life cycles of like, okay, hey, you know, we know that in X amount of years, this product may not be made anymore. We may have to find an alternative. And at the same time, I'm looking at the O&M side, right? The solar power plants. I'm like, wait, we're 25 years. That's what we're penciling yeah. in, you know, in these so 25 years. Right, right. So it's a data point. And then I ended up uh, inheriting uh, the, you know, voluntold, hey, the first solar tracker, we're not making it anymore. Uh, but we had three gigawatts out there. Uh, you can do O&M supply chain, right? Can, you know, go manufacture all the parts. Right, even though you know, because we're we're out of main production, so it's gonna be different suppliers, right? Much lower quantities. And through that, I even found like, technically, I was an OEM at that point, right? Running a supply chain, and I was running into my own obsolescence issues with subcomponents. You know, I want to make these boards, I want to make these pieces of equipment to continue to service the assets, but I was running into issues where it's like, well, yeah, this capacitor, this microprocessor, whatever it is, 
It's not that it's not made anymore. We have to find an alternative. And that really opened, you know, when that started happening, I was like, wow, you know, if I'm experiencing this on the tractor side, which has controls in it, but, you know, not as many as a, say, an inverter, and it's got, you know, uh, power supplies and other stuff, right? I'm like, man, this this is going to be all over the place. Um, and that uh, that coupled with a very early repowering opportunity I had for solar to do three sites in Germany, you know, Europe, Germany had been far ahead of deployment of solar than the U.S. And we needed to, uh, for various reasons, uh, replace the inverters. Uh, these were central inverters at these sites. And, uh, you know, this harkened back to previous, I call, tenant improvement projects that I had done at uh, a previous employer, an electrical contractor. And the, you know, the challenge around matching new equipment, right? New equipment that's designed for a completely different power plant into this old power plant was both mind-numbingly frustrating, but also fascinating. Um, and I really got my, that, that was my first hook into the repowering, uh, you know, what I was excited about. I was like, man, this is going to come, this is going to come. This is frustrating and exciting. That's my love. Um, and, you know, you take that Take my my experience with obsolescence, or I would say my real world like confirmation. You know, not only is repowering going to happen because of X Y Z financial benefits of higher production, more efficient equipment, but because these assets are going to obsolete. Um, those 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 really hooked me into, you know, I would say a path where I was really looking at, okay, one, how do we address the obsolescence problem for as long as we can, and I would say sometimes. You know, to clients, I'm gonna we're gonna do the spare parts package or whatever it may be to bridge you to repowering, right? This isn't this isn't a replacement of it eventually, but this is a bridge because at some point, you know, I may not be even if I'm making the custom components, I may not be able to continue to do that. Right. The squeeze for those custom components may not outweigh, you know, completely repowering your site or whatever asset it is. You just said something that I've never heard anybody really correlate, and I want to make sure I heard it right. The repowering process in Germany in 2013 for you, having worked at a major electrical supplier in South uh, in, in in Arizona, looked a lot like tenant improvements (TI), right? So anybody coming from real estate, it's good to try and correlate these things for folks that are trying to get into the industry. And I've I've heard a lot of real estate. Um, Anecdotes for solar, right? Solar is real estate without the occupancy risk. Um, <laughs> that's a great one. Um, but I've never heard anybody correlate the upgrades to a solar plant as tenant improvements. So uh, the lo logical question I have there is at that time, and maybe this is useful um, context for folks that haven't been in the utility scale side, was First Solar acquiring this project in 2013 or did they already have the project? How, what was the ownership structure of that project? Yeah, I I probably can't get into to do too deep of that, but um, all to say we were you know we were contacted to go assist um, or more or less just kind of take care of this, and we got some partners in Germany. Um, I at the time was still running like the U.S. part of the business, which was big. So I instead of flying out there, which just wasn't feasible to continue to run the U.S., I just ended up working like three months and nights so I could be. <laughs> I could be, you know, real time with Germany. Um, and I had a, a great partner from First Solar that was out of Australia. So we were, I mean, anyway, uh, we were trying to balance time zones. Um, but yeah, we were we were kind of point. Like that was our job was to repower it. Um, ideally before the German winter, that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> but in any case. Can we um, unpack the term repower? How's that evolved and what does it mean today? Uh, for a utility scale solar plant, let's not worry about like um, C and I at this point. But for utility scale, for all, for for this purpose, is five megawatts and up. But really, we're talking you know tens of megawatts, hundreds of megawatts. What does repowering yeah. look like? People will probably disagree with me. I think repowering is about being able to add additional output, whether that's through you know more DC fuel, uh, you know panels, whether that's through more efficient equipment conversion ratios you know, at the inverter. Uh, and to me, that's a repower. Um, I kind of term retrofits as, oh crap, this isn't working. I'm not going to add any more to the grid. I'm just trying to recover, you know, the energy potential at my side I had. Um, 
too nuanced for, mo- for many people, but that's how it works in my head. So more efficient fuel. I love that you put it that way, uh, which is how do you harvest the electrons that were coming from the sun? I mean, guys, if you aren't familiar with that, um, sort of the, the perspective that Josh is giving, our competitive resource in the marketplace is molecules, fuel, literally shipping oil and gas and diesel and that gas and pipelines or trucks around the world and burning it, right? So that's the way the utility industry thinks about the resource that gives them electrons. It's fuel. We get our fuel from the sun, thank God, for that nuclear reactor in the sky. And um, the way that we can harness more of it as time goes on is taking what maybe was at this time for solar, like nine and a half to 10% efficient modules and upgrading them to 13 and 15% efficient modules. And if you're doing it on plants with... Um, with crystalline silicon, maybe you're taking it from like 19 and a half to 25, right? Like the numbers are pretty linear. Um, and inverters got really efficient over that time. Mm-hmm. Like they went from high 80s to basically being required to be 97% or better. And that was a massive opportunity, right? So today's numbers, since we'll call it 2011, 12, they're a lot different in terms of what you can do for the inverters. But everything that was installed in the aughts, you could get a 10% bump in efficiency just by swapping inverters, just so people can understand that. I think that that's yeah. not really obvious to folks that maybe jumped in the industry five years ago. Yeah. And, you know, to, to tie that back to like tenant improvement, you know, I had done, uh, I would say it wasn't pre my solar days, but it was when I was doing electrical construction and maintenance and solar at, you know, Wilson Electric. Uh you know, it's a, you have this building, you have this structure that you have to make improvements to within certain confines, within certain build parameters. And you have a budget and you got to figure out how do I get all these new pieces of equipment? You know, for example, LED lighting, we were doing a lot of LED lighting at Wilson Electric conversions to it, right? How do I get this into it at the same budget, increase efficiency and have an ROI for the customer? Because that's the only point that that's the only thing that matters. So I've heard you say that not only did it occur to you then, decade ago, that that was the next big wave, but you started to think, this could be a career. Mm-hmm. How did that recognition impact what would become the career you fell into versus the career you created? Yeah. So, you know, 2013, yeah, I've always known, and we were talking 10 years, right? I mean, these sites are 10 years older than what we have in the U.S. So a l- large part of that time... Very focused on O&M. I knew that was, uh, I had a good sense that was the path into repowers. Um, and I was still, and, and I was just as passionate about spare parts and trying to solve these obsolescence problems as I was about repowering opportunities. I was really waiting, kind of like waiting for you. Like, okay, these assets need to age. We had to start seeing when is the repowering wave going to hit the U.S.? And I'd say that every once in a while. Like, And we had, we had a few opportunities here and there um, while at first order do similar stuff on some of the older sites. My time at, uh, you know, first solar O&M was part of the acquisition into Nova Source combining right. SunPower O&M SST. You know, uh, the juggernaut it became. Were you a part of that conversation or did it happen to you? It it happened to me. You mm-hmm. know, I was uh, Troy Lauterbach and, and the team at uh, uh, first solar, right? There was, that, there, were, there was the Nova Source opportunity and, you know, uh, it was part of my role running supply chain. I was part of the merger, mm. um, do, you know, those type of operations. But it was going to happen. And I was very excited about trying to see where this went, right, right. at Nova Source. Um, you know, and I would say, you know, okay, Nova Source R7, I had this itch in the back of my mind. And they had two itches, actually. One of them was a bespoke asset manager, asset owner, O&M focused supply chain. Mm. Right, because I had had the technical, I had technical know-how. I like to say enough knowledge to be dangerous to myself. Right, right, and I had the supply chain. Like I'd watched and and helped to build with awesome team members, what I considered a world-class supply chain at First Solar, and I was like, what could could that be a business by itself? Right, because I, I mean. Honestly, for Solar Nova Source, we're only servicing our LTSA customers. LTSA is a long term service agreement. Oh, and immigrant, Thank right? You. Yeah. I was like, but there's so much pie out there, right? <laughs> like, like, 
yeah. could this be could this be independent by itself? Could it stand by itself? Yeah. Um, and that was that was the itch that was like, okay, out of these two I call them itches because you know an itch, like you just gotta oh, yeah. scratch it at some point. Otherwise it's always there. It's like yeah. I gotta get to both of these at some point, otherwise it's always gonna bug me. Mm. And that's what I would say after a year or so really started me thinking, okay, how do I go do that? How do I go do the first one? So let's unpack and what that is. It came R7 supply. You have said it to me in the past as like the concept of building this niche business. Like how do you niche down in a way that maximizes opportunity in an area that is still not getting a lot of attention? So can you talk to me about focusing on that one segment and how you visualized it as, as an entre entrepreneur? My supply chain experience to a large extent had always been trying to train, assist, uh, persuade vendors to do things I needed them to do that were outside of the box and or blending parts I knew I could get from them with my technical know-how um, or the technical resources I had, right? Because it's not just me. It's like the wealth of data and information and insight yeah. out in the industry to come up with the unique solution I need in my certain situation. And a lot of the times at First Solar, I ended up having to do some of it myself because I couldn't bridge that gap. So I kind of knew there was, you know, the brick and mortar, the traditional mega distributors, you know, they weren't primed to really focus in on this segment. And I, and that was an opportunity that I thought was, was pretty big Hang on, um, so out there. You're referring to like the existing distributors that would provide bits and bobs, parts, spare yeah. parts. Yeah, the blending of that, right? Really coming because I, you know, as an as an O and M supply chain, we would take what they have combined with our services and service and supply chain being, you know, kind of demand planning, inventory management, you know, processes, procedures, best practices, and deliver that service to, you know, the asset owner at the end of the day. Yeah, and I really envisioned that being able to stand alone by itself, right? Instead of just having to be tied to one O&M, like being able to provide that to sell performers, you know, owners who sell perform their O&M, and even being able to provide that to other O&Ms. What's the alternative? Like, how are they doing it now and, and versus the way that you were hypothesizing and proposing it be done? Put me in the shoes of somebody that's managing this that you wanted to serve. You know, I have a failure. I got to go find the part. Yeah. Do we have that in inventory? How big is this project? Oh, uh, 250 megawatts, right? Got it. Or you know, this it's person, a project. They really put fleet. me in the shoes in their shoes. Cool. I'm a full time. Right, so, I'm a full time operator at a plant in the middle of Nebraska. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to say plant or fleet? Whatever you use the terminology. Right. I'm asking you to yeah, teach yeah, me. Yeah. So like, I have this fleet of assets, mm -hmm. right? Different sites, same particular type of asset. Um, how, how, what's my inventory strategy? Mm -hmm. Do I inventory centrally? Do I inventory at the site? Do I Got use it a hub and spoke style distribution method because at, at how much inventory do I have? Mm. What's my demand curve? Yeah. What, you know, at what life cycle is that asset? What's going to, what's that, how's that going to impact mm. that demand curve? Those are questions in the back of the mind, but a lot of the, you know, O&M activity traditionally tends to be, I have an outage. Uh, do I have the spare parts? Yeah. Do I have the yeah. right part? You know, sometimes, you know, you replace one component and you find another one that was really causing the problem, right? And it is a lot of what I call order churn, right? We are just trying to get all the components to the site to repair and get the asset back yep. up and going. And really what I was proposing, and, and of course, and let's let's not forget obsolescence, right? Yep. You know, that's that was starting to become more and more of a bigger impact. Yeah. Uh, like, I can't really get that component as easily anymore or the price has drastically increased. Right. Um, or there's, you know, definitely during the COVID, uh, it's going to come in a year, mm. right? My lead time's a year, right? What do uh -huh. I do now? And this is the part that's going to keep your inverter down until it come, arrives. It could it could be a fan. It could yeah. be a fan and your inverse derating, you know, oh, because God, of a fan. That's a good point. And now you've got to right? communicate that up channel to the, to the forecast team that is telling the utility how much power to expect and telling your investors why you're not delivering on the forecast. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think at First Solar, you know, we had built a, a, as a team, you know, 
the, these processes, really kind of mirroring that of traditional manufacturing MRO, where you know you can try to put seventy or a large portion of your uh, procurement activities into a demand profile, where you're not necessarily going hand to mouth, but you're backfeeding yeah. uh, inventory that's being used. Mm. Right? You're always going to have those emergent issues. You're always going to have uh, that part didn't fix it. Right? You know, we have a, a, a sympathetic failure of the control board now that we replace the IGBTs. Mm -hmm. No, it happens. But you can ideally have those be, you know, the few that happen in the week versus the many. And you yeah. spend, you know, the first part of your week really doing just standard restocking of, of parts. And you look at, you know, without getting too much, you know, uh, into the supply chain nerdiness that I could, you look at your demand curve. Right. What's you know, what parts is what are what assets using or even a fleet of assets. Mm -hmm. Right. And even to the point, like, are some of these parts, you know, can this power supply, what what number of assets can this power supply go into that can impact how many I have on hand? Yeah. Right. A lot of manufacturers use similar parts. Not every parts create equal. Yeah. You know, as as solar is scaled, so is O&M. And the prices have gone lower, just like they have on the EPC side, meaning less people, less resources to be able to do this type of activity, right? So hence order churn, right? You're just trying to put out as many fires. You can see smoke on the horizon, but you can't get to the you can't get to the smoke in the future until you put out your fires today. So you're sitting in a cush job. Everything gets rolled in to Nova Source. It's kind of like the industry sitting back watching what's this experiment going to look like, and you're recognizing Jesus. We've got all these wonderful processes. We're still dealing with X, Y, Z problems, but this is only 5% of the market, maybe 10% of the market max, right? That we're addressing at, from the LTSA perspective because you're not, Novasource at the time isn't trying to go and like provide services to all the other competing assets. It's got a basket of assets and then, and then it's trying, and, and, you, and you're looking at it going, okay, this is going to be a bigger problem. I think that one of the keys to solving this problem is this particular part of the niche of the business. Tell me about the moment where you, maybe it was a conversation with a friend or your wife, where you go, not only am I going to try to go do this, but I'm going to need some, some funding. I'm going to step out of my job and I'm going to go create what became R7 Supply. Can you take me to that moment? Our good friend, our mutual friend, Austin Tabor, always stayed in contact with them, even as I was trying to build, um, at the time, a competing business. Uh, you know, so we were, you know, I had this in my mind, right? But always, always talking, right? And, you know, a few others that, uh, you know, I was telling them, like, I I, I keep, and this is, why, this is how I knew this was an, an itch I couldn't ignore. Even though my role at Novasource necessarily wasn't solely f supposed to be focused on, you know, building maybe or, or even proposing a uh, supply chain distribution or a niche supply chain business, I found myself, uh, I couldn't spend more, I couldn't, I, I couldn't find enough time to spend on trying to build that concept. And, you know, I, I had done some calculations, like what kind of capital, how long would it take me to go do this myself to the, to the level I want to. Because, you know, one of my favorite, um, well, I guess mantra quotes is like, follow, you know, lead me, follow me or get out of my way. I, unfortunately or unfortunately, am not a very patient person. Like if I see something I want to go do, I just want to go do it. Yeah. And in talking with them, you know, we, you know, we're really thinking like, okay, I think we know some people that might be interested in this idea, you know, that might believe in this vision. So let's set up some calls. I ended up doing that uh, towards the end of... Uh, Probably 19? 20, 20? 20, 20, oh, no, it was 18 uh, months. 22. It must have been 22. Yeah, yeah. 22. Um, and, and ended up doing that with a renewable, right? So, because um, I, I... For context, time, renewable at the time was quietly buying up a lot of the your peers exactly. like Austin, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was watching all my, my buddies getting, you know, acquired um, or, you know, some some fashion invested mm -hmm. into. Yep. I saw that they're, they had a different view of the O&M business, not just LTSAs, which is big and it's important, but also the transactional services. You know, the solar support thing was a repower and parts play. You know, there were other transactional business being bought into that, and that was really exciting um, uh, for me because I really thought the market in general, as the assets age, as the industry changes, the need in the industry is going to change as well. Right. 
So I ended up talking with them a number of times. And, you know, within a matter of three months, our, you know, R7 was created. And by March of 23, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was starting really within the renewable platform, this new, you know, subsidiary entity, um, which was fantastic because I had the back office support. I kind of, my, my investment strategy was very simplistic. Now there, there's pros and cons to every entrepreneur of that type of strategy, yeah. right? But I didn't have to worry, you know, I could say, I could put it to the back of the bus, it's done. I just want people to hear this, right? Like the creative approach that you took, you didn't step out and take your savings and try to go build this, right? In, in the sense of like building this startup, you effectively went from, you like skipped the bootstrap step and found an investor and it's what we call in the industry strategic, right? Someone who could eventually, if they see that the business meets milestones, acquire it or be involved in selling it to a much bigger person in the industry. Like maybe it catches super fire and like someone like Beacon or Green Tech goes, wait, 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 you're, you're crushing our business. We want this. And now Renewable, who helped fund it, gets to participate in that. Like that's such a smart strategy that you that you employed. Was was there mentorship on your side that helped you really think through and craft that, or did you kind of have to go it alone and like Google a bunch of stuff? I tried to make it as simple for me as possible because again, I wanted to get to solving the problem. I wanted to test this. I want one. I wanted to scratch the edge and I wanted to test it. Back to the patient's problem I have, and so I made it very simple. It's like, hey, look, you stand up this entity, right? We we I come in. I run it. It's a it's a subsidiary, which at the time, you know, that was that was kind of how um, a lot of the renewable companies were running as separate subsidiaries. And from that, I have back office support. I can work with an IT team. I so have an HR team support built in from the start. I, I can, you know, they had an Arizona office that had a twenty two thousand square foot warehouse in the back. I couldn't ask, you know, right by major freeways and an airport where I could hotshot stuff out of. Like everything I looked at, the more I dug into like the early due diligence of like, do I want to do this? Do I want to make the jump? I looked at it as like, if Josh, if you want to get to market quickly, this there you can't find anything better than this. And the renewable, you know, they were very accommodating, right? It was a crazy vision. It was this, hey, I'm not going to do any services. All the rest of your businesses, for the most part, are services. I may create some custom products. Primarily, I'm going to run supply chain processes for customers. What do you think? <laughs> you know, it's like the a niche of a niche. It's and, a niche of a niche, which and is crazy. Were, now, 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 can you? Yeah. I don't know how much you can share, but talk about the explosive growth. And I'm curious how much your network helped, like. What do you think oh, took man. what do you think helped and contributed and and I want you to answer this from the perspective of like if I were trying to think about how what you did could correlate with how I build a media company or how someone else builds their c and i business like what elements of your your prior career contributed to the success versus like the renewables team? Can you help me unpack that and at the same time discuss the explosive growth you experienced with numbers if you can share them? Yeah, so you know the 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 way in we which we structured allow me to kind of day one really get into my computer and start hitting the emails right, start yeah. networking. Um, had a lot of great partners through the subsidiaries. I mean, there were a lot of good friends in these sister yeah, companies. Yeah, so there's a baked in. There's a already at Renewable a baked in uh, customer base that you were, I presume, given entree to. Yeah, we could you know we could work with them. Um, you know, wasn't, uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in not requiring anything like that. So like where I, where I provided, where I provided a a competitive advantage to their other suppliers, I did it where it fit in with my focus. Hmm. Right. I did it. Um, and you know, what, you know, really started from an organic, I didn't have to worry about, you know, the kind of the startup, you know, that, that bootstrap startup life, I could really go swing for the fences. Right. Yeah. In the first year. Um, and I say you're March to the, you know, end of December. So nine months or so I tried, I did, you know, I had this, this, uh, uh, sleuthing supply chain, right. The sleuthing side of my business, right. Go find hard to find stuff. Cause I know where they're, I know where all the bodies are lie, you know, lie. Right. I did try, you know, cause I'm, I'm a big believer in data and like diversification. I tried the traditional distributor model and like, I was like, oh, Okay, did six months of that, not for me. And I was spot on, like the amount of capital I would have needed to really meet those manufacturer requirements would, would have been immense. Um, so 
solely focus on sleuthing after that. In terms of finding that opportunity at the time where I really want, like I was restless, you know, in my, like it was, it just happened. It was fantastic in the way the timing happened. You've got a family, right? Yeah. What's your wife yeah. saying at this point? At, like when you're leaving the, the nest, the safety of Nova Source to go do this, she cheering you on? She's scared? Yeah. Oh, it's cheering me on, right? I think she knows once I got an itch, I just have to go do it. Otherwise, it always bugs me. So she'd, so she'd rather see that happen. And, uh, you know, we talked about, I, I was, you know, I sold her on, I was excited about what, Renew what Renewable was doing, their market approach, uh, you know, where they had make at, made acquisitions. I thought they were, you know, smart acquisitions in the industry. And the fact that I was able to you know, get into the wind side, you know, learn from our big brothers or, you know, the guys that have been doing it 20, 30 years, before, you know, in terms of a uh, commercial scale, right? Utility scale before I was even thinking, you know. Uh, Unpack that. What'd you learn in that process? The buying decisions are the same. They've got the same challenges. They're just more mature about it. Mm. And what I mean by mature, um, repowering is a market. Like it's, it's, it is a market. It's not a niche market anymore. Like it is a market supported by, you know, mega OEMs. Yeah. There's a, um, yeah, there's a reason the whole Inga team business got bought out. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause they have 15,000 or something, 50,000 maybe <laughs> in site, like sites. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it is a huge yeah, opportunity. I, you know, they've just been, they've been in it longer. It's become just like the early days of solar when we were, figuring it out and guessing. And today there's a model, there's an understood model. There's an understood, I won't say rule book, but you know, uh, there's roads, well-traveled roads, right? And you know, the repowering retrofit, it's not a well-traveled road yet in solar, but it is in wind. So it was very interesting to see. Yeah, it was very interesting to see the, how that, uh, uh, the dichotomy between the two, uh, the two industries. Before we move on, I want to unpack a bit um, because you know so deeply um, this aspect of it. Can you talk a bit about the challenges that OEMs face in managing assets today, um, specifically in the face of how OEM fees work and the structure of contracts? Unpack a bit the implications of the way the OEM compensation model structure, look, fee and structure and contracts challenges the supply chain model. So uh, early on, a lot of stuff was in the fixed fee. When I mean fixed fee, like, you know, you've got corrective maintenance, preventive maintenance, remote operations, boots on yep. the ground. Um, you know, it is a fixed price in which the O&M goes and has to go, you know, perform and, and meet certain metrics and KPIs. As the market changes, you know, prices got more, had to get more competitive. There's only mm -hmm. so many ways you can change that, you know, to, uh, you know, a labor, a technician costs the same. In fact, increases. So a lot of things got started getting stripped out of those O&M contracts. So for example, corrective maintenance was, you know, a time and material instead of mm -hmm. in the fixed fee. So, you know, from a cost perspective on the, you know, LTSA or on the O&M contract, it helps reduce the cost because there's less risk in it, right? As well as less required materials and things to procure. On the supply chain side, it can challenge that MRO, that demand planning, mm -hmm. because in the past, when I'm doing fixed contract correct maintenance, the risk is mine, right? So I can make decisions. I can make them very quickly. Uh, you know, time, uh, mean time from order to delivery is important, yeah. right? Because it's not until you get that part that you can do the repair. So that mean time is very important. And so when more and more parts had, you know, started to come, uh, into this time material, now you're adding more approval processes, more time in between need identified and sometimes first need identified. We need this part to see if it fixes the issue to part arriving. And some of that's just, you know, this, this approval process in terms of what's the time material cost going to be. From a supply chain perspective, that challenges the ability, challenges the ability for you to be, you know, proactively ordering parts based on the demand curve to some extent and pushes it more into a reactive mode in which mm. you're reacting to a, a need and trying to get these approvals and then trying to get the part going. I want to give a hat tip to a friend of ours, another friend um, and uh, former Nova Source employee, Rob Andrews, whose company also got acquired, watched as they built that business um, into something that was, you know, 
really creating value in the industry. And I went for a drive with Rob and I've shared on the pod without giving him due credit, a concept that he shared with me that you guys were thinking through at Novasource. That's kind of one of these conundrums in the industry where we're talking about like ever spiraling downward pricing, contract evolution, and the reality that there are these forces at work. One of them is workforce constraint, right? We just don't have people that are trained technicians. And so and this, and this is a, the, the hat tip to Rob, like he said this to me and it was the first time I had this, like, you know, that brain explosion emoji. Um, we're creating our own inflation in the industry. And it was like a light bulb moment. Like, obviously that's true because when you hire someone who's an L1 technician, which is very loosely defined from Pierce because you need that person at Novasource <laughs> to competitors and then Renewable comes in as the upstart and they've got a bucket load of cash and they go hire that same person. Well, that person just got two raises in a period of probably 24 months because we're on the solar coaster and it doesn't really mm. look bad that you move to three different companies. But all we've did is pay the same person to do the same job more money instead of building a training program to train people on how to do it and keeping the costs where they ought to be. I, I just share that because I think that that's something that I haven't given proper credit to Rob and he really did sort of teach me that concept. Um, how do you see the the two sides of the coin evolving right now in 2024 and beyond? That is contracting for O&M. How is that contract model changing? And then staffing for asset management. So you can take them in together or separately. Yeah, the contracting model, I think there's it's going to be a diversion in terms of as these assets age, I think more and more O&Ms are getting data points as well as asset management. They cost, you know, I mean, just proving what we assume they cost more to operate, mm. right? Um, I, I think older assets are going to have to have a higher price. Um, or I would imagine and imagine, theorize that someday future O&M contracts may come with a repower, right? Hey, we'll get this price for you, but we need to address these particular challenges that we will face as an O&M. And we'll while have we repower them, built in. Maybe, right? And, and maybe there's a financial I mean, vehicle that. around it. Yeah, you could theorize it. And maybe there's a financial vehicle around Right, that uh, that way to repower. I mean, there are some tax incentives, but I really th around repowering the the eighty twenty rule. But I think also there's got to be a, a way that capital is that feels like an insurance product, doesn't it? It does, and and I think there's got I think there's got to be a little bit more evolution in the way we look at that. Because again, mm -hmm. you know, it's great that we're putting gigawatts or terawatts into the ground, but it, it, these assets don't live out to their pro formas that the banks are expecting them to. Uh, you know, who's going to invest in the next next project? What if we could bake in, again, to the theorizing, bake in some of these tax credit transfers as like, I, I've asked this uh, for years because back when PVC Exchange tried to do this, they tried to get First Solar and others to pay, I don't know, like a, a, a thousandth of a penny per watt into a central fund. And they're doing this in Europe, mm -hmm. right? Where it's just like, Pepsi and Coke and everybody else paying a bottling fee that goes into a, a, a like a sort of nationwide recycling program, right? Um, when will we see that as an industry oh, where wow. at the manufacturers contribute towards the second life of these assets and or the tax equity folks contribute to the repowering of these assets? I don't know. I mean, I think Fortunately, unfortunately, there probably needs to be more data points, more large repowers hitting yeah. to like say, okay, this is an acceptable, you know, rate. And and for solar, it's going to be divergent, right? Mm. Every site's a little different. Every asset's a little different, but there'll be some commonalities. And I, I you know, I, I think sometimes, um, you know, and we're talking a lot about repowers and I always see spare parts as a bridge to repowering eventually, especially once you start hitting obsolete spare parts and having to find alternatives and, Maybe even make some custom components, right? Blending yeah. components together, work within an asset. Um, you know, it usually isn't the desire to repower and, and do away with the issues and possibly even have new warranties and newer equipment, easier to service, whatever it may be. It is the budget. It is, we don't have a lot of, we don't have enough money. To, I mean, how many, how many of these do we repower? Can we leapfrog them? All right. Yeah. Can we do a few right now? And then, you know, cannibalize them, kick the can down the road a little bit. Do you still see staffing as a hurdle in 2024? How are we handling it? I, I do. Um, I, you know, 
the the nice thing when I was at uh, our you know doing R seven supplies, like I was just worried about my supply chain constraints, not so much <laughs> technician mm. staffing. But I would say, you know, on the wind side, they do a lot of training, upfront training, and there's cost to it, right? Who does the best? Who's the like the record, oh. the flag bearer? Who does the well, best training? You know, there's a uh, GWO, right? G-W-O. Which is like a standard. It's a standard to train, and there's a lot of trainers that follow it. So they actually have standards, right? Uh, and you get GWO, or you get this certified. And then you can go, you know, you, whether being you're an independent trainer or you're a entity with a training program, are certified to do that training now. And you have certified instructors. It's very, regu- you know, it's very structured in that fashion. I want to pause there for a second. If you're listening to this and you're currently doing O&M in the solar sector and you are just dying to not be an employee, go learn GWO and figure out how to apply it to the solar industry and you've got a business. Like Josh just really mapped out for you an independent solo solopreneur business that can make you money tomorrow. Yeah, I, I uh, something, some standardized, right? And maybe ACP and SIA and, and uh, you know, they come together and they start, you know, mm-hmm. we have the NAPSAP, right? But that's really, yep. I, I, it doesn't, as a, isn't as applicable into the utility scale where I think, yeah. you know, there's, there's a lot of challenges. It's a higher level technician. Um, I mean, that is, you're, you know, journeyman. Uh, it blows my mind that there's still not an equivalent to NAPSAP for utility scale. I, I'd agree, and maybe I don't know if there is, but I know a lot oh, of Oh, you would training. know. Come on. You would know. <laughs> it just... would be a competitive advantage. If it existed, somebody would have already used it yeah. against you. The true. But, uh, you know, it's a lot of OJT, and WIN doesn't have that. They do they do a training. Now, that's not to say you don't come in as a tech one, but you come in with like, okay, I'm in this industry, right, versus floating in and out. And I think that's a lot of the challenges solar's had is people floating in and out of solar. Yeah, I think this is the liability we have right now with how the government not understanding our industry is thinking about this apprentice program. And and they're incentivizing Mm -hmm. the propping up of electrician uh, uh, union in in many cases. I don't want to make I'm not saying this as a as a knock like we I am all for organized labor where it adds um, where it provides stable jobs and um, and, you know, and where it advocates on behalf of labor laws i've seen you and i both seen this like companies fly bulgarians literally into chile into the atacama desert Mm -hmm. and save a hundred thousand dollars flying someone from eastern europe to build the project instead of employing locals right and that's where unions actually do a great job of helping protect local opportunity and and actually creating and they're stuffing like 10 of them in one bedroom right so um i'm my my point here is more that we we currently have this apprentice program, which is, in my opinion, directed to a very very narrow slice. And if we created apprentice apprenticeship around actually the the trade in a way that doesn't force them into like being a journeyman electrician or a journeyman carpenter, like the existing trades, we don't have like a solar trade, <laughs> right? Yeah, because we don't have a GWO. I bet you the wind industry has their apprenticeship programs dialed, and they're loving this. And this is again part of the reason to to take the opportunity that renewable, you know, was willing to believe in the vision. Mm. Uh, was I saw them looking at the problem, not, not even today's problem, but the future problems a little differently, and structuring a business, whether you know, uh, structuring a business really focused on that, like okay, where is this industry going in the future? I mean, that was exciting. That was super exciting. Well. I'd love to know what gets you out of bed in the morning now that you aren't focused on R7 day to day. You successfully exited your first entrepreneurial venture. I'm still working to get my schedule, but I still get up at 630. And I'm, you know, I mentioned I had two itches mm-hmm. uh, to scratch. Um, I'm working on the second one. Can we get a teaser on the sort of general direction? This is, you're going stay to in, stay in the repowering O&M side of the business? Are you going somewhere else? You're going to go fix wind? <laughs> Uh, staying in solar, um, you know, R7, uh, and, and now it's renewable supply now, right? I mean, it was a wholly yeah. owned subsidiary, uh, fantastic, new leadership, a lot. I mean, there's been a, uh, the combination of a few parts businesses under the renewable flag. Uh, now renewable supply, they're, I'm, I'm excited about what they're doing. Like they're taking what were breadcrumbs and like these trial and error 
uh, things I did, right? Uh, parts packages, which is truly that MRO, that that planned supply chain for customers. It's 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 accelerating, um, and I'm staying in that focus, right? At some point, you can't get the parts anymore, no matter how skilled you are, and or you can make it, but it's not worth the squeeze, right? In terms of like the cost to do it, what the price would have to be. So I'm I'm definitely staying in the okay. How do we solve? this obsolescence issue. And in my mind, at some point it's retrofits and repowers, you know? So I'm, I'm looking probably maybe a little bit far down the road into particular assets that need to be, that will have those challenges. Um, I have a sense that given you've seen more assets than most, you have picked a very specific problem that's like as, as niche as it gets. And you're like, I, I think I could probably make a few million dollars fixing that problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I and that was that's you know, awesome. That's why I learned from R seven to stay focused. Right, there was a lot of opportunities that I had uh, mm. to go make massive dollars. And as, as you know, as a you know, yeah, I was a subsidiary, but I had a bank account. I had to look at or manage yeah. cash flow. It can be very appetizing to go after those big dollar values, especially as you look at your bank shiny account. objects, shiny objects. But I, I you know, stay focused, stay focused, and I mm. think you can be successful if you just you know double down on that focus. Mm. And at the very least, you know, and I, mm. I always love knowing. I've I've always said I have no problem being wrong. I just want to know. Did you always know that you would be an entrepreneur? Is no. that something that a niche that you need to scratch? No, no. Uh, I didn't have the itch as a child. Uh, no. Carefree skateboarder in Arizona, you know, burning my skin on asphalt. I, I did the solar thing, and, and that's how I took it. I was like, oh, I'm going to do the solar thing uh, for two years to make money for for college and university, finish my my education. And then I went to go work for this electrical contractor uh, for uh, it, as I was going through university. My main, I was going to go uh, LSATs. I was going to do law. You were going to be a lawyer. I was going to be a lawyer. Yeah, my stepfather is a lawyer. His father was a judge. Like it wasn't. You're such a disappointment. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my biological dad was a, was a general contractor, and I think I've always liked to say I kind of blended the two to some yeah. extent. Um, oh, did you spend time with him on this on contractor sites? Did you have a relationship with your biological father? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we had, I'd spend summers, and you know, I was crawling, pulling wire, and you know, doing plumbing and stuff underneath a mobile no homes way. and stuff like that. So I, I blended the two of them, and I find joy in both. Um, mm -hmm. as long as I get to touch both a little bit of the hands on, um, love that stuff. Um, and then structuring, strategizing, right? Like, a, but anyway, that wasn't, it, it was, it, you know, anyway, long story short is like, okay. Um, the more and more I tried to, I would say maybe get away from solar and I call it solar gravity. I've always warned mm -hmm. people that I've interviewed to come work in my teams is like, be cautious. If yeah. you take this job, there is a gravity that will surround you and you will find it very hard to get very. away from. Um, yeah. I just kept getting pulled back into it. Um, you've been warned. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You've been warned. There is a gravity. Um, uh, there's a gravity around it. Very hard to get away from. And, and that's what I found. I found it was like, you know, uh, electrical contracting firm ended up acquiring another one that had a solar department. Mm. And uh, they're like, well, Josh, you understand the solar stuff. I was like, yeah. And then the first solar, that was, I would say when I decided to join for solar, that's when I was like, okay, I can't get away from this. It yeah, is very prep. interesting. I got, you know, I got to take this to the next level. That's, so, that's super cool, man. Not everybody gets the opportunity to go to a company like First Solar at the stage that you got to join. Like if, the, if people are listening, like Josh was there around the time they acquired Ray Tracker yeah. and then subsequently immediately shut it down, it felt like. From the outside looking in, I sold the last Ray Tracker project. Did we talk about that? No, no I way. Did. I yeah. was Oraloma, Oraloma Irrigation District. That oh, was my dude. project. And guess what? It was the last project for PV powered uh, modules before, or PV powered inverters. It was crazy. Like that project is, uh, it's a it's a wonderful project. But yeah, it was like a little four hundred and fifty kilowatt project. And I remember uh, Mark uh, saying after you guys after they got acquired, he was like. You won't believe this. This is the last project that's going in full for so. <laughs> it's like, all right, well, let's see how that goes. Um, yeah. Anyway, I um, I wanted to ask you through the process of both the acquisition at Novasource and the building out of R seven. Is there anything you reflect back on now and you, and you think, go, man, this is probably one of the best lessons I ever learned 
that really prepared you as an entrepreneur? Yeah, um, a, a lot there. That was uh, that was a major acquisition, and mm -hmm. I, I completely took a, I took a different role at Novasource. Um, still very tied to supply chain, but over product and strategy. How do we strategize? Like basically, how do we build this better? Right? Yeah. Um, okay, so here's the things I really took away from it. Numbers matter, but be cautious of paralysis by analysis, especially in the early days. Like you got to try it, learn, adjust, move forward, stay focused, try stuff. Right? I tried just I tried brick and mortar, like general distribution, like getting deals with power supply manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Tried it, learned from it, learned. Okay, yeah, don't have the capital for this. Don't have the time. It's not interesting adjust and move on but may do it do it quickly especially in early days you you have the you can do it like as you as 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 the end as the business matures you don't always have those opportunities it's a bigger risk to change your model but the early days experiment there's nothing again i have no problem being wrong i just want to know yeah. right uh don't be a, don't be afraid of being wrong try it out find out um pick your partners carefully mm. big one like I know renewable, uh, they were sniffing. You know, I had some great champions in there that were like, this guy, like he knows what he's talking about. It's a little weird what he's talking about. You probably don't understand the stuff coming out of his mouth, but you know, like, you know, he's got, he's got something here. But I, I was, I was, you know, pick your partners carefully. You just, you gotta, that, that is so important. Um, I, what I heard you say as well, though, is it's important to know that you've got champions internally. Know you have champions internally. Um, and leverage them leverage them for knowledge i mean austin uh uh bill jacks you know they had been through this they had years you know i maybe had i don't know maybe more years in solar but not more years in entrepreneurship and i would take as many lessons whether i wanted to hear them or not from them as possible um so like you know have your champions pick your partners and and again you know i i moved to focus Right. I was doing multiple things at Novo Source. I kept finding myself just having to scratch this itch. Right. Have a focus and stick with it. It's okay to pass on the big dollar opportunities if it's outside your focus. Most importantly, when you pass on it, and this is big for your clients, help them. Hmm. You may not be the person to solve that problem. Help them along the way. Help, you know, if you know how they can solve it, direct them, guide them, introduce them. It pays dividends in the in in the long term. I can't tell you how many times I've been on calls with customers that didn't involve a tra that didn't involve transaction. Customers are potential customers. Didn't involve a transaction, just a conversation. Um, it's so 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 important. I I learned to value it, but I I I, I was so lucky that I did that early on because I'm I'm a curious guy. I you know I'm a curious guy. I like to hear about the stuff in the industry. It's so invaluable to be seen and to to be able to provide insight to your customers help them even if you aren't uh you know the source of their of their uh, resolution i could not agree with you more is there anything that you changed your opinion on maybe presented with data your data guy and you go oh i was wrong about this you know nothing that was massive i did a product at r7 it was a custom fan with a reusable housing I mm -hmm. thought that was cool because usually the fan and the housing were thrown away. And I was like, well, I could create a reusable housing. That's no problem. Uh, drastically underestimated the time, effort, and trial and error it takes to create a bespoke product. And this, I don't think this was hyper complicated, but I mean, kudos to the kudos to the OEMs and manufacturers out there. Kudos to the project man to, to the product managers, like. I, you know, I try. I, I bootstrapped that. I was doing uh, whips, uh, crimping. Uh, uh, I was doing. I think I did something like four thousand one hundred um, individual like uh, uh, strips on these wires. Drastically underestimated. You know, dr drastically undervalued um, what it takes to create a product. I mean, when you see companies come out with a new product, you know, celebrate and clap for that. That was hard. Hard one. Um, you know, battle. What do you nerd out about when you're not thinking about uh, you know, building some the next product that's going to revolutionize the industry? You know, I I hate to say it, it, it 
I, I find it difficult to disconnect because it is a passion. Uh -huh. Um, I kind of nerd out about like right now I, I'm a, I'm an all in, like I don't, I jump both feet in. Right. Um, and so, uh, let's, uh, I'm still trying to find a hobby. I guess you'd say my hobby is trying to productize a retrofit, right? Um, yeah. it is, and it, I don't You're know. You're such a typical entrepreneur. So absorbed. It, uh, absorbed in it. Um, it's, uh, you know, my wife's like, you never do the same thing twice. Mm. <laughs> it's like, I was like, honey, I just don't have any, you know, I'm like, man, it's so tough to find time. She's like, it's because you never do the same thing twice. Yeah. Like you're always doing something different. I was like, oh, that is true. She's like, it's because well, you get bored with stuff. Like, yeah, is there, <laughs> is there something that is recurring in terms of like how you manage the inputs, the information coming in? How do you, like, what resources do you rely on? Yeah. I, I structure my days. Uh, pretty rigorously. I'm a, you know, I eat a, uh, I structure it mornings, email answers, right? Before lunch, I do research. You know, if I'm going to look, dig into some uh, drawings, some specifications, I do it before lunch. After lunch, it's strategizing. And I, every, and I don't say every day. And I, uh, I try to go to the gym four times, a, uh, four times a week and no headphones, no music, nothing. And I do that around three after I've been through my strategy. Like, am I, you know, even as an entrepreneur, like, am I on the right track with this? Is this going to be good? Mm -hmm. um, am I overthinking this? I let those thoughts simmer, go to the gym, go through a routine. And I just let the silence in my head, like solidify any new insights, come back, do a little bit more work, help kids with homework, eat dinner. And I think that's really kind of just, I've in startup mode. Right. I'm kind of in startup mode. So I'm, I yeah. kind of stick to a very rigorous, you know, um, schedule. Yeah. And I kind of found the same thing at R7 when I was doing it. Like I was just like, okay, mm -hmm. quotes are at this time, strategies at this time, you know, at night, try to wind down, like just find a time, shut the computer down. Do you have a consistent bedtime routine that helps you recharge? Yeah. Um, about nine. Try to, and now the kid and I got a 13 and a nine-year-old, so sometimes the kids don't cooperate with my bedtime, mm -hmm. but uh, try to about nine. But rather, regardless of whether what my bedtime is, 6.37, I'm up. Doesn't a week weekday, weekend, vacation, it doesn't matter. I'm like, I'm yeah. up and I'm, and I'm going. Same, whether I'm sick or uh, I have to be really sick to not be up at seven o'clock latest. Yeah. I have a 7.30 alarm. Uh, that is almost like a fail safe. Um, but I pretty consistently find 6.30. Uh, I, I'm happy when, <laughs> this is not always, you'll appreciate this as an entrepreneur, but like, I know that I can't get less than five hours of sleep. And I know that I need more than six hours of sleep. So like last night I went to bed at 1.30 and I had my alarm set for 6.30 and I can see it says like, your alarm will go off in five hours and seven minutes. I'm like, I sure hope I get seven, get to sleep in the next seven minutes. Um, but what I know is that I'm building up sleep debt, basically. I know I'm going to have to get a couple of nights where I go to bed at 9.30 and, uh, and try to sleep till 6.30 to, to make up for it. Is there anything that you've integrated? I um, mean, you've, obviously you've outlined sort of your daily routine, but is there anything that you've found that's a consistent practice or habit that has given you leverage in your life? Yeah, it is the quiet time. I mean, and yeah. what I mean by that is be bored. And that is hard for me. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a go out and go do stuff. Right. That How do you board, engineer that quiet time, that bored time? That was my gym. Right. I let okay. my body do work and I let my mind be bored. Hmm. Um, even when I'm working, I listen to podcasts and listen to news. Like I, I'm not listening. It's in the background. It's noise. Um, helps me be kind of focus in, in some hmm. fashion. Um, but I've, I've heard that my voice helps folks. I'm kidding. <laughs> Listen to your podcast a lot, actually. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I'm honored. Absolutely. But uh, uh, I, and this is this me, mm. I need time where I can force myself for my mind to be blank, work through those problems, work through those questions. And for me, because I'm a goer, because I'm a let's go move, it's the gym. I can let my body go do that. And it's so funny. Like, it's almost like when you drive your, uh, drive to your work, right? And you're like, you don't even remember how you got there. I will right. get to the gym. I'll go through my routines. And when I'm leaving, I'm like, did I get everything in? What was the routine right. I did today? 
because it's just ritual. It's ritualized, mm. and my brain wasn't thinking about it. But I, when I drive home, that's when I'm like, okay, this. When I come home, I'm going to do an hour or two hours of this, this, and that. So I really structure that kind of. I won't say midday, but like three to four. At four is the latest. I want. I want to go to the gym. If I can't do it at four, I will work out at home. Same process. Silence. Weights. Somebody out there is is thinking, man, if I could just text with Josh, or I could connect with him in some way beyond this podcast, how would they do that? What's the best way for folks to reach you? Right now, LinkedIn. Just message me. Yeah. Uh, apologize okay. if I don't get you to You accept it. every every outbound uh, or inbound uh, connection request? I try to, and at least cool. I'll if there's a message in there, I'll respond. Um, and I try to make time just to connect with people. Um, I may not be the same day. I'm not always... Uh, yeah. Anyway, but LinkedIn. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. So we always wrap with uh, some version of a bold prediction. And I would like for you to paint for us a vision of the mature utility scale solar industry that is managing assets in a way that you're proud of. Uh, what did we get right over the next 10 years to get us there? Um, I think first and foremost really starts with uh, and starts with, but a big uh, maybe not starts with, but a big factor is OEM recognition and productizing repowered focus products, products with, with flexibility in them. Um, that especially on the inverse side, that is that's big, right? Um, it is very hard to find an inverter, especially a central inverter that will accept 600 VDC as a you know as a high put, right? Just can't find it, um, right. and so I think OEMs embracing and seeing that market opportunity, and you know, working towards that. And I, I would say, you know, there's the SMA Flex out there. It's the first one that I uh, worked with us. I, I was a big champion of that at R7. The SMA Flex um, uh, hit. It, it was a flexible uh, uh, VAC and VDC in, inverter um, that's on the market. And, you know, that's the first first manufacturer I've seen actually, like, put marketing behind a repowered focus product. Um, so I more of that. More of that. More of that, please. And like we were mentioning, like, there's got to be something besides the 80-20 rule to help with repowers. Um, I, I, you know, uh, Scissor, he's decommissioning, right? There's a lot of that going on in the CNI space. With where the industry was 10, 12 years ago, how much energy we put out there, we can't decommission all of them, right? There's got to be a retrofit repower. And so there's got to be some some financial way of assisting these assets to go into their next evolution of life. And I say assets like solar farms, right? But like solve the problems. At some, at some point, obsolescence is going to rear its ugly head whether an OEM wants to or is forced to, right, do the subcomponent availability, we got to prepare for it. And it's going to become way more public because right now somebody can take them off of a project out in the middle of the desert. I'm not saying this is happening and just go throw them in the, a hole in the ground, but you can't take them off of a Walmart or a, or a Safeway and pretend that people didn't see that. Um, and it's happening. It's happening right now. Man, this is such a fantastic conversation. I look forward to seeing if our industry keeps up with your vision of how we mature. And as we do, we'll bring you back on and talk about the fantastic new ways that you are creating value and productizing uh, the repower the, uh, future that you have uh, crafted for us today. Josh Froughton is an uh, industry entrepreneur and innovator, uh, created R7 along with our friends over at Renewable. Uh, to rethink how we supply the, uh, the the operating side of these assets, not the building side of them. And uh, it has been truly a joy to get to know you better through this process. Thank you for investing in the time to do it. Thanks, Nico. It's been a pleasure, man. Well, if you are still listening to the sound of my voice, you are one of those all the way to the end of the podcast listeners that maybe is just running like I would be and can't hit stop or skip to the next one uh, unless you've got AirPods Pro or some other really fancy headphones. So thank you for sticking around. Uh, I hope that you're also listening in because you'd like to know if there's some other way that you can connect or find resources. We're trying our best to get 
the links that you need into the description of the podcast player that you're using, whether that's Spotify or Apple Podcasts, uh, whatever you use, it should be right there in the description. But certainly the link to mysuncast.com where you'll find our episode notes page is right there. So you can click through to that. My LinkedIn account is right there. And I, like Josh, respond to as many. I try to get to all the DMs, but I also try to respond to all the comments on our posts. And that you will find a post about this episode on my LinkedIn. Do us a favor. Go jump in and comment. Let Josh know how thankful you are that he took the time to do this episode. And let me know if there's somebody else that you think we should also bring onto the show. Bill Jacks, if you're listening, you're next. Coming after you, my man. And so many more conversations that need to be had about how the industry is, in fact, maturing and what we are going to have to do as entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs and executives in this industry to make sure that it that we do it responsibly and efficiently. And capital efficient is, is one way to look at it. I hope that you've gleaned a way that you can build on your career or your business thanks to the insights from Josh. There are more than 675 episodes like this in our back catalog. So please go back and uh, nurture yourself with some of those as Josh and others have done. Uh, and I'd be so you know, pleased and proud to know that you leave us a rating and review when you've done so. If you really believe that this show is worth listening to, uh, please show us some kindness in that podcast app. Give it a five-star review and enthusiastic uh, thumbs up to let others know that they should be check, tuning in to Suncast as well. And I want to say a final thanks to the sponsors to help make sure that the show is free to you each and every week so that all you got to do is pay your attention. I know that you've invested your valuable time. Hope that you have gotten a return on that as I promised in the outset. Remember, you are what you listen to. Thanks again for showing up, Solar Warrior. It's half the battle.